it's okay. Well, <laughs> it's 4:40, so I am gonna start off with introductions. Um, my name is Matt Riedemann, and I'm Matt Trinish, and we're gonna talk about the gate today. Um, at a very high level, we're gonna talk about what is the gate because it's a very loose term. Um, talk about what can go wrong, debugging it, lessons we've learned, and then hopefully questions. Um, go ahead. So. Um, a little bit about ourselves. I'm uh, the QA PTL. I've uh, been in that position since Juno. I've continued to get elected unopposed. I don't know if that's the right way to describe it, but. <laughs> um, and uh, as part of that, I do, I'm a core, review, a core reviewer on a bunch of projects, including all of the QA projects, which I guess makes sense. Um, and I work for HP on their OpenStack upstream team, working to make OpenStack a better project for everyone. And I um, am a core reviewer on Nova, uh, Elastic Recheck, um, also Stable Branch Core. I work for uh, IBM on the IBM Cloud Manager with OpenStack team. Uh, been about two and a half years now that I've been involved. And a little background, I, I initially got involved with packaging. And as part of the packaging, we had a rudimentary CI system, which was running Tempest. And when I had issues with Tempest, I got talking to people in the QA channel, and uh, that's how I got sort of roped into working on some of this. So the first thing uh, is, what is the gate? Um, because it's different things to different people, and it's depending on the context, what it is you're talking about. Uh, basically, it's a pre-merge CI system, um, but it's also, so it's the actual you can be talking about the infrastructure, you can be talking about the tests, uh, the jobs, the configs, it's lots of different things. Um, there are different test jobs for different projects. It can also be thought of it as a reference config. Um, it's the gate, and for the merit of this talk, is basically talking about things that are hosted on the community infrastructure. The reason we point this out is that third-party CI is not hosted on community infrastructure. Uh, most people probably know what third-party CI is. That's uh, mostly like vendor drivers that are run by um, vendor, vendor companies. These would be usually like closed source um, backends. So the community is not going to be running closed source vendor proprietary testing. Um, and we don't gate on those. So meaning we don't restrict approval of a change to get merged on third-party CI. Um, we gate on unit test jobs, but the majority of testing happens with integrated testing using DevStack and Tempest. And another sort of confusing thing when you're talking about the gate is there are multiple queues to this. So there's, for the majority of what people care about, it's the check-in gate queue. There's also the experimental queue, which is where you put um, jobs for experimental configurations, like Ceph with shared storage was on the experimental queue for a long time, and Cells was in the experimental queue for a long time. And there's like a Fedora 21 job. There's just lots of these different jobs that aren't um, voting on every change. You actually have to specifically run those experimental jobs. And then there's periodic jobs that run overnight um, and post results to the mailing list. So this is a very simple picture of what happens when you submit a code change. Um, all of these different test jobs, so there's PEP8 for static analysis, unit tests, um, and then different combinations of DevStack and Tempest configurations. These are all running in parallel. These aren't sequential jobs. Um, and then each DevStack Tempest change is kicking out about 130 um, instances per run. This is to get to just sort of an overview of a development Garrett workflow, showing that there's, there's a cycle here of in your local environment, I, if I'm working on Nova, I'm cloning down Nova, working on a bug, making a change, I push it up to Garrett, where we're gonna be running all of these tests on the change, um, and it's going through review, somebody's gonna minus one at you, make a change, push it back up for another patch set, it all gets retested again. Um, eventually, when it's approved with uh, workflow plus workflow, or m as many plus twos as you need, it goes up into the gate queue. Assuming it gets through the gate queue, it passes all the tests there, and it merges. Then it's cloned, or it's uh, mirrored out to GitHub, and you start the cycle over again, and then everybody's rebasing off of your change once it's been merged. 
So when we talk about the gate, it's always fun to talk about numbers. And this, uh, the gate at scale has some very interesting implications when it comes to trying to figure out why things go wrong. Um, so I thought I'd describe a little bit about how big the gate is. Um, so in the past six months, we've run over 80 million Tempest tests in total just for the gate queue. So that's not, that's after the change has been approved by two core reviewers and ready to be merged. We run over 80 million, we ran over 80 million tests for that. Um, as part of the check queue, each proposed um, commit spins off between four and 20 dev stack environments to run tests on um, in, at the same time in parallel. Um, it depends on the configuration for the individual project that the change is pushed to. Um, and each full Tempest run starts about 130 second level guests in the dev stack cloud that spins up. Um, which is not a small amount of work for a single VM and a public cloud provider. Um, and then when you look at that whole data set for the gate queue, um, and you look at how many things fail, um, an individual te test run in the gate has about a 0.77% chance of failing. Um, and if you look at each test individually as a single unit, one individual test has a 0.015% chance of failing. Um, that's not entirely a fair way to measure because some tests are far more likely to fail than others, but in aggregate, that's a way to describe it. These are also tests running concurrently, yeah. right, and? Yeah, we, we, the test environments run four, uh, four workers concurrently hitting that dev stack cloud with four API calls at the same time. So you get a lot of interesting and this is about 1,300 tests in a full run? Yeah, it's a, it vary, the number of tests vary between like 1,200 and 1,600, depending on configuration and some other factors. Um, so when we look at these gate runs, what could go wrong is an interesting question. Um, we've got a lot of things that can go wrong, to be honest. Um, we've got dozens of jobs with different configurations. And um, because of the pre-merge nature of the CI, things pass most of the time. Um, so when you have race failures um, that are less than a percent, you're very unlikely to see it um, with one job, let alone you know four. Uh, so oftentimes we don't catch these issues when they're um, going through review or even in the test results for that change itself. And when that happens, um, we don't end up we don't see it until later in the process. These these race conditions bubble up when we run at that big scale where we're running all of those tests all the time. Um, it's, a, it's a question of seeing like less than 1%. You're not going to see that um, on one. You're going to see that out of, out of 1,000. Um, and then we also catch issues in dependencies and things. OpenStack uses a lot of external projects and a lot of external uh, libraries to do its work. And we often catch issues in that. And that's not going to be caught with our code review system and our testing of our code. I mean, it will be, we'll catch it with our testing, but we won't see it in our review. Um, we found that the failures um, that we hit in the gate break down into about five categories, which is um, upstream service breaks. Um, the way the gate is configured, we rely on, you know, pulling packages from PyPy um, and running on public clouds. And oftentimes there are, you know, issues with those upstream services that we're using. And we catch that almost immediately. <laughs> um, Sean has a nice uh, statement he likes to call the OpenStack CI system the Nagios of the internet. Uh, <laughs> and it's very true. We catch a GitHub outage or a PyPy outage immediately because we're running tests all the time. And when that happens, everyone runs around with their heads cut off. What happened? My change didn't fail, or my change didn't pass. Um, we have OpenStack uh, infrastructure failures where, you know, some, the machinery behind this is very complicated and sometimes something goes wrong like any other operational service. And uh, when that happens, it causes a failure and uh, impedes uh, developer uh, throughput because their changes can't land. Um, then we find a lot of bugs in OpenStack where we have race conditions or state corruptions or database deadlocks and, you know, that's what the gate debugging is really about, is you know, fixing these issues. We also have issues in the testing, of course, um, and we try to fix those as they come up. Uh, 
I like to say there are less of those than in OpenStack, but who knows? <laughs> um, and then we also have bugs and dependencies, which we hit a lot um, because, you know, sometimes we have a pretty robust upstream testing environment, but not all open source projects have the same awesome CI setup, and we catch a lot of bugs, and we have to fix them in the upstream uh, projects, either by reporting the bug or working around them or fixing it ourselves. Um, so when we're talking about the gate, we have lots of different configurations um, that we run in. And knowing these configurations actually can be important for debugging the failures as they come up. Um, we, have, we run tests with different database backends, uh, mostly MySQL and Postgres. We use different storage drivers like Ceph and LVM in different configurations. We differ between uh, Nova Network, Neutron, and a lot of other things like that. And then there are other jobs which do other things like upgrade testing and uh, testing operations at a large scale using a fake libvirt driver and multi-node environments. And knowing the environment your test runs in is kind of important uh, if you're debugging a failure with that. Um, here's a, just a tree diagram that explains how some of these jobs are configured. And it is a nice little web because we have lots of different configurations. And this is just a small subset um, that are the common ones. We actually have a lot more job configurations. There's a nice file in an info repository that explains the whole job configuration map, which is very, very long. It's a big YAML file. Um, but the, the key thing is, like, uh, the job that it's running in actually has an uh, important impact on how you debug these failures. Um, specifically, the MySQL Postgres one, which is why it's got a bigger box, is that there are actually additional differences between those configurations when you run those jobs. Uh, MySQL runs with Keystone and Apache and does not use a metadata service, while Postgres runs with a metadata service and Keystone using Eventlet, which, you know, that actually uh, impacts when things fail. Um, so I, before we deep dive into you know, a debugging example and how you actually look at this, I thought it would be good to uh, call out some things we've hit in the upstream CI system that actually have had impact on real people running OpenStack clouds at some point that, um, to show, kind of highlight the importance of doing this uh, for everyone, uh, not just developers. Uh, so the first one was the number of CPU workers that we ran with in different projects. Um, so this bug was specifically for the gate, but it turned out to uh, kind of compound with all the projects. We were running all of the API workers in the gate with multiple, with CPU workers equal to the number of CPUs. And we run in a single node, all in one environment. So that meant for, I think it's six or eight API services were running that many times number of workers. And it ended up eating all the memory on the dev stack nodes, and things were crashing randomly. Um, turns out when we were looking at the projects, a lot of them didn't really have sane defaults. Dev stack was the one setting all of the, the CPU count. But what that ended up making us do was go into all of the projects and set a sane default for the worker counts to try to you know, help the deployer story with that. Um, another one was LVM operations, where timing out, or they weren't timing out, they were taking longer to complete than the RPC timeout in Nova when it was making a Cinder call. Um, and that was because Cinder was looking at every single device on the, on the machine instead of, or every single uh, volume, logical volume on the machine instead of just the ones that Cinder created. And uh, that was causing Nova to fail when it was doing volume operations. And that's something that could easily hit anyone who's running a deployment with an LVM. Uh, back end. And a fun one, which took us a long time to figure out, or I should say Salvatore a long time to figure out, um, was that there was a kernel panic when you ran with NBD and network namespaces in Neutron. And it would just randomly hang the box, and there was no more logging and no more indication as, why, as to why things failed. Um, that was a simple fix. We just stopped using NBD because it didn't actually make much sense in our environment, or arguably a lot of environments. Um, and the last one on this little uh, sample list is um, a current bug, actually, that we're hitting right now in the gate and tracking. Um, and that's when uh, you resize and restart, or resize or restart a running compute instance in a cloud. Neutron breaks connectivity, and then you can no longer talk to it after you resize or restart. And we're currently tracking that failure, and the bug is still open. 
And that's something that could hit anyone who's running Neutron and tries to do a resize or restart. Um, it's not a common failure, just occasionally. Um, so now Matt's going to go through an example of how we debug a failure. Yeah, so I actually, at the beginning, I wanted to ask, with the show of hands, who's actually ever proposed a change and gone through this in the community? OK, so that's good, because I've given this talk with like two hands. Um, so it's sort of, you can't really appreciate a lot of this unless you're working on it. So I, I wanted to go through an example of, this actually happened um, like two hours before I first gave this presentation, is there was an upstream library that released, and it like broke everything. And or, uh, there was just a thing that broke, and all of a sudden, there's just, like somebody in an IRC channel that's saying, um, like Jenkins failed on my change. I have no idea why. I'm pretty sure it's not related to my thing because I'm not changing Swift, and all of a sudden, like Swift doesn't start. Um, can you help me out? So there's usually a set of steps that at least I go through um, in debugging a thing like this. So in Garrett, you're going to see something like this, and it, we get, I guess I didn't point out earlier about non-voting. So there are jobs that run that aren't voting, meaning they can't. Jenkins won't minus one the change and prevent you from approving it. Um, but for voting jobs, in this case, it's the uh, dev stack full job for Tempest. This one's actually running Nova Network. But um, So it hits a failure. I click the link, and I go into the console log. So I start in the console log, and all of the tests are dumped out. And 99% of them are saying, OK, the test passed. I'm searching for failed. I see this uh, test delete server test failed. And then I go down further, and there's eventually a stack trace. I don't have the entire stack trace here, but there is a Tempest stack trace that says build error exception, this server failed to build, and is an error status. And it's dumping out the message that's coming back from the Nova API that says uh, no valid host, which this is a super like helpful, useful error message. <laughs> but the, the useful bits here are, um, that I wanted to point out that I highlighted is if you look at the Tempest tree, the way that the API tests are broken down, they're broken down by service. So there's a compute service, a network service, image. These correspond to Glance, Neutron, Nova. There's identity service or test for Keystone. So I know that something in Nova is busted, which is kind of obvious with this example. But there are also scenario tests that are running. Um, they'll like bring up a VM, attach a volume, resize it try to attach uh, interface, something like that. You're trying to hit all these different services in a run. And the scenario test will point out this test is hitting Glance, Nova, and Neutron or something. Um, the other important information in this for me is the instance UUID. <coughs> because when I need to start digging the Nova logs, I need the instance UUID. So from here, I go into the Nova logs because I work on Nova. I know that generally no valid host is going to have some terrible stack trace in the Nova compute log. So I would start there. Um, a lot of, usually you go into like the Nova API log to see where the request came in, where it's going. Um, is there an error in the scheduler? Usually there's not a thing in the scheduler, but compute log is where stuff, the interesting stuff usually happens. So in this case, I'm looking for the instance UOID. I find a big, ugly stack trace like I expected to find. And at the bottom, it's showing us that, well, there was this libvirt error. And it said, um, received hang up, error event on socket. That sounds not, yeah, not good. Um, but this is a thing that people could actually be hitting in their real clouds. And so from here, then the next step is I've got an error. So I've got a fingerprint for an error. I would go out to uh, logstash.openstack.org, which has a Kanbana dashboard. And I would plug in, it's probably nobody can probably see this, but Basically, I take that error message, and I say, I've got an error message from the compute log, put it in there, and run it over the last seven to 10 days. The logs are only stored up to 10 days. Um, I run it through there, and I want to see how many hits is it getting. Because a lot of these times, somebody has a failure, and they don't think it's their problem, or they don't think it's their change, but it actually is their change. And they'll argue with you in IRC, and then you go off to Logstash, and you say, well, yeah, it's exploding terribly, but there is actually a thing that says which changes it's hitting, and it's like that one guy's change or something. So you can say, well, it's just you. Um, please get better at like debugging your own failures. Um, 
the other the other, the other nice the, the better thing to do is if it's all check queue that's a little suspect then you have to start looking at what the actual changes are that are failing if it's gate queue though it means it's on a thing that's actually merged most of the time if it's if it's like unit test jobs those those fail in the gate for different reasons sometimes. But if it's like a Tempest job or a grenade job, usually it's something that's been merged that's racing and failing. Um, so after this, you check Launchpad to see if anybody's reported the bug. Um, in this case, this is a, this is a reported bug. Um, but from the bug, we have this thing called Elastic Recheck. And then you take that fingerprint that you had with Logstash, and we write queries against this, we store them as YAML files in this project called Elastic Recheck um, with the fingerprint for the bug. Once that merges, after, um, once it's in, every time that Jenkins fails on a change, it will scan the logs, check them against the fingerprints that we know about, and then it will come back to Garrett and say, or it'll come back and it'll comment in your Garrett change that, oh, Jenkins failed, we think it's this bug because the fingerprint showed up in the logs. Um, and we've got this dashboard off on uh, statusopenstack.org for Elastic Recheck that shows for the check queue and the gate queue all of the different race failures and it's showing the hits. Um, that little, <laughs> when we were looking at this the other night, we were thinking like, did we actually fix this for like a day? It turns out that that was when we did the Garrett upgrade and like, it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, but we can also see we've got open reviews. So when people are actually pushing changes against these bugs to try to fix them, um, when you see, and they're, they're ordered by number of hits, so if you're out there and you're looking for reviews and you see somebody's actually trying to fix this thing, maybe we should give priority to that review. Um, and it'll, the link will take you off to Garrett. So I already kind of went into this, but this is an example of the comment that you would see. So in this case, I actually like this example because it's showing two different bugs, it's showing three different test job failures, and in one of the tests, it doesn't have a recognized fingerprint, which means we should probably go off and check the logs and see if we can categorize whatever is failing in that job. So, and this is a view of a page for all of the things that are failing in the gate that we don't actually have categorized. Um, and if you, it, you probably can't, I don't know, it's probably hard to see, but there is an overall categorization rate, which in this case is 70.8. Yeah, for me, for me, if I come in in the morning and that's at like, if it's less than 70, it usually means there is something pretty bad. If it's like 45, it's usually very, like you can find any of the logs and there'll be something that, like some service isn't even starting because of something. Usually that's, in my experiences, there's an upstream release and that's, Sean wrote the, uh, what released script or whatever it's called. Broke. What broke, yeah. It basically shows everything that released in PyPy in the last like set of time and we can say, oh, it's Boto released a thing again and broke us. Um, <laughs> but then we can take that, we classify them through Elastic Recheck, we get these numbers down and when we can get the percentages up, then we're usually happy. Yeah, and this is a good thing that I know both of us have in our daily routine is that we look at this page and look at open uncategorized failures because getting that categorization rate up helps us prioritize bugs that we're actually hitting and lets us you know, identify real failure, real bugs in incoming patches because with that throughput rate we have and the low percentages of failures that we're actually hitting, these races, um, they compound and they cause real development workflow issues, especially around release time when everyone's trying to push their patches and the system is completely strained. So keeping that categorization rate up um, helps everyone uh, with development. And uh, the other, yeah, the other important piece is the 10-day the window is critical because if we can spot that a thing started spiking, if, if there is a failure that started spiking in Logstash and the the picture I had with all the green bars, like that's a thing with older libvert that we're probably, we're gonna either have to work around it or something. It's an older version of libvert and trusty. But there are, there are times where you start seeing this failure and in log stash, it'll be like running up and then in, within the last 24 to 48 hours, we have this like giant spike. And that means that somebody merged a change. Most of the times it's either like a library release or somebody merged a change that's all of a sudden, we were talking about, um, the small percentage of a failure on your one change and then once it's merged and it's running on thousands of patches a day, you hit it with just tons more. 
then we can start looking at the Git history in a specific project and see, um, oh, the IPv6 tests are failing and somebody just merged this thing in Neutron for IPv6 in the last 24, 24 hours, so let's see what it is. Oh, it's in the stack trace that's here. Revert it, like, immediately, and then ask questions later because it's blocking, like, everybody. Um, and then maybe we do, like, postmortem after that, but it's up to whoever merged the thing that has to sort that out and figure it out. So lessons learned from this, um, the NCPU workers thing, we need to keep sane default sane, especially considering how just terrible it is to configure OpenStack with a billion options. Yeah, um, that, that comes back to like DevStack um, being a reference config. That's something we try to do um, with values we set in DevStack, try to push them back to projects to you know, make sure their defaults make sense for everyone, not just the gate environment. Right. Um, so grinding rechecks, this is where, again, on a, on a, on a single change, if, it's, if it is more than a 1% time failure, somebody, there was the comment earlier from Elastic Recheck that says, we hit, you, you hit these bugs, if you don't think they're a problem, just put in recheck and it'll run everything through the gate queue again or the check queue. Um, there are people, or there are times where people will just think like, well, it's not my problem, and they'll just keep rechecking and rechecking and rechecking until it eventually gets through and then it's merged and it's in the wild and it's hitting everybody like I was saying. Um, and this has come up and is an issue in the mailing list and IRC and people will say like, well, if, you, if you're already categorizing these things and you know about them, like why don't you just do auto recheck so that when you hit a bug, like as a human, I don't actually have to hit recheck in Garrett. I don't have to care. You just keep running stuff. Um, and generally, I mean, there's lots of reasons like why we don't want to do this, but basically it, you don't want to like perpetuate races for good reasons. Um, another thing was, um, I think that's a, a come up before too, is like, well, these, these one tests are kind of bad. Like, we, or we shouldn't be adding like more tests. We already like test so much stuff. We shouldn't be testing so much because it's failing so much. It's like, well, <laughs> it's kind of a bad idea to like cut down on the testing. Um, like in Kilo, we just started getting, with the multi-node job, we just started getting live migration testing. Um, and we, we made the Ceph job with shared storage voting. So now we actually have a voting job with a shared storage backend, which was a thing that we weren't actually testing in Nova outside of the experimental queue for a long time. And cells, we're working on getting like an actually like voting cells job, which is important for people that actually care about cells, which should be lots of people. Um, another thing is keeping stable branches stable is really hard. But, you know, there are people that actually care about stable releases. Um, biggest, like the, the thing we were talking about earlier today, the thing with stable branches that I think of is, especially with like these random SSH issues, is in one release they'll be really bad, we might skip the test for a while or we might do something to like try to curb these off a bit and then we'll come back to them because we're at the end of the release and it's blocking everything and then um, we'll turn them on and then it's not such a problem anymore. Like, what, what happened? What changed? We should probably backport the changes to stable. It's like, well, if we knew what the actual changes were that fixed the thing, we could do that, but we don't know. And people don't really keep an eye on it. So stable kind of doesn't benefit from the changes that people are working on in Tron. Um, adequate logging is critical. So this is the example I have for logging is uh, the live migration thing. So we got live migration voting, and I think within the same week, we actually merged a change that broke live migration, because at the time that we merged it, the live migration, the multi-node job was non-voting. So it showed up as red, but Jenkins didn't minus one it. So we didn't, you just, as a reviewer, you sort of think, like, you don't pay attention to things all the time, or you didn't think of them. So live migration starts failing, and we're thinking, and this was like Kilo RC, this was after RC1 for Kilo. So between RC1 and RC2, we knew that we broke live migration. Um, and we, you'd go into the logs and there was basically nothing. It would, you know, pre-live migration and then failure. And what's going on? And then we start looking in the code and there's this like, there's this horrible pre-live migration method in Livered Driver that is passed in a dictionary of Boolean flags for are you doing shared, are you doing block storage, are you doing volume backed, all this different stuff. We weren't like logging pretty much any of that. And there's a 20 different conditionals in that path. So it's like maybe we should log the input parameters to this method to figure out what happens between the time that we come in and the time that we explode. A simple little change like that, and then it was, it was obvious. It was immediate. We hit it, and we were like, oh, we were passing null to this method, and it was, if it's going to work, you probably got to provide the flags to make it work. Um, 
So it, as an operator, I would imagine that this is yeah. If you're running awful. the cloud and you hit someone who says, my live migration failed, and you look at the logs and it says, trying live migration, and then live migration failed, that's not <laughs> entirely yeah. helpful to figure out uh, why it did. So you know, debugging these failures, actually, you see all of the fun in the logs that makes it impossible to debug, like some logs don't log anything, or others log a stack trace on every single call you make, which is my favorite example. Um, <laughs> So there's, um, that's something that the logging working group, I think that's what they call themselves, and a set of logging guidelines, which I think Sean started at some point, um, are trying to address. And that's something you can see if you start debugging these failures that you know, logging is inadequate for a lot of things and we need to improve it. Um, and then the other thing was, in my mind, it's, I, I think about this quite a bit, is when we, when we have to fix a problem when we fix a bug by fixing something in DevStack and it doesn't get into the release notes, people aren't or shouldn't be running production OpenStack with DevStack. But the developers, we're all used to DevStack and we're used to having the CI system running on DevStack. So we want to get the thing fixed. We want to get it fixed for us. And so we get it fixed where it naturally to us needs to be. Um, and maybe it can be done in code. I mean, there, there was some stuff with the way like PyPy libraries or gets, the Python packages get set up and stuff and you gotta do that a certain way. You're not gonna do it like in Nova because it doesn't have anything to do with Nova. Um, but in the case of like the LVM bug, there was, there was a change to Cinder um, to configure how LVM, LVM ran with Cinder and then there was a change to DevStack to use this config file in Cinder. And I was like, oh, this is great. And it, it had like doc impact and it said, you know, if you're gonna be running without um, LVM, the metadata daemon or whatever with, L with LVM, you probably want to use this config file. And after Kilo was released, I was looking through the Kilo release notes and I saw that it doesn't say anything about like using, if you're using LVM, that you should be using this config file if you're not running this other service. So we got to get changes at least documented because the people that are running Ansible or Chef or Puppet need to know about this stuff so they're not reinventing the wheel and fixing these same bugs over and over again. So just a couple of places to get more information about this, because this forum, you know, there's a lot of learning. You have to know how OpenStack works in operation. So having channels to get more information about this and feedback and help with debugging. So there's the OpenStack QA channels where most people who spend a lot of time doing gate debugging uh, hang out on IRC. Um, you can also go to the mailing list, but there's a lot of noise there already. So maybe not sending a general mailing list post about how to debug the gate it may not be the the most productive. Um, then there's the uh, Elastic Recheck page on uh, status.openstack.org. That's where all of those uh, fun graphs are and the uncategorized page are all there. Um, then as part of the OpenStack bootstrapping hour, which disappeared sometime around January, I think, there was one topic where Matt, Dan, Jay, Sean all talked about how to debug the gate, um, and that's up on YouTube for anyone to watch, where they go through a little bit more detail on Yeah, it's actually stepping through the logs, going to Logstash, doing a, doing a query. It's more of an actual demo. Yeah, it's, which is kind of hard to do in a presentation. And then the, uh, the infra team maintains a, uh, all of their presentations that they present around the world all the time. Um, they put them on a page that anyone can view if you want to learn more about how all of the machinery of the gate works, which having that background actually helps a lot when you're trying to debug these failures, figuring out how these environments are configured and deployed, because, you know, OpenStack is, um, you know, kind of malleable in how you can uh, deploy it and use it, and uh, knowing that background helps when you're trying to figure out where things went wrong. Um, and with that, um, are there any questions? I don't know how much time we have left, but if you have a question, there's a microphone right microphone. there. Um, and just walk up to the mic and ask a question. Six minutes? Or, I guess we can repeat it, unless this is going to be a question. Matt and Matt, um, when you find something that you need to revert in a project like Neutron, because it's breaking the gate, and neither one of you are core in that project, what is your process to be able to very quickly revert something like that? Do you have a process where you've got to go get a hold of neutron cores, or do you have like super nope. capability? I yell, at, I yell at Kyle Mestre. It's his fault. 
the I, PTL of Neutron. Yeah, you, I, we hang out on IRC. We know a lot of people. You always you just you go to the Neutron channel, you go to the Dev channel, you ping cores, and you say, "Look, okay. this is breaking the gate. It's provable. Revert this change." So you just go find cores for that particular yeah. project. Okay. Yeah. There's yeah. actually in the newer Garrett's. There's actually a revert button, which makes it super easy for me to find the thing and get history. Go to Garrett and then hit the revert button, and then show up in the Neutron channel and say, "I, you know, this all blew up. Here's the revert. I think this is probably it." And then they go sort it out. So you have speed in getting the revert patch out, and then they just have to approve Figure it. out if it's actually that, yeah. Okay. And then there's like the mailing list shame afterwards. That, uh, oh, the gate's broken. We think it's yeah. this. You yeah. Know, everyone, FYI, because people will, you know, everyone will show up and ask the same question like 10 times, like, oh, this, it failed yeah. on my chain. Why did it fail? And you, yeah. Well, because it's failing for everybody. So. Yeah. I've noticed, Matt, you're really shy on the mailing list shame. So if you want to feel <laughs> more proactive. Well, it's funny because Joe Gordon is usually like, you know, calling dib. We're calling dibs on who's going to actually call this out as a, yeah. we broke everybody. So let's yeah. let him know. So, yes. yeah. um, so, so I was basically a, a, a quick question. Provided that, for example, we have a, we have a, get, we have a get bug where we want to find like, like a dependency which was, uh, which was providing some, some issue. But we can see that when looking at block stash, there is no longer any problems. Should we still create a bug and then pre-check about the bug? Or we could maybe just say, OK, that's, that's OK. Then. So uh, for the recording, the question was, if you see a bug on your change and you look at log stash to do the due diligence and you see that it's fixed, should you still open a bug on that change um, if there isn't one already? And the answer is actually yes. And the reason is for the uncategorized rate. Um, we want to make sure that that categorization is high enough so we're not you know, missing issues that are more critical that are still open. So if a bug hasn't been filed and there isn't an elastic recheck query for it already, but you've noticed the bug is fixed, um, Going to, the, going to the effort of filing the bug and submitting a query helps us. And that query will be removed after the 10-day window for our log stash um, evaporates, and we're not seeing it anymore. But it's good to you know, do the record keeping so everyone can see it. Hi. Is there a plan to run uh, different Neutron configs like VLAN, VXLAN, OVS, and Linux Bridge? Um, in, as part of the gate? So right now, it's only OVS yeah. in the gate. Um, That's what I'm asking. There have been a lot of community discussions about what we should be running in the gate um, and what the default should be and what Neutron and Scope should be using as a default. Um, the current plan, I think, is to move everything to Linux Bridge. Um, the Neutron team, if it's an open source driver, they could push their own jobs to use whatever open source backend they want that only run on Neutron changes. I haven't seen any patches to configuration to do that. Um, the other drivers and other configurations which rely on proprietary systems go to third party yeah, CI that's, and that's That's separate. not an issue. I think what I'm saying, I see the discussion of moving to Linux Bridge, but my request would be to keep some configurations or some one or two jobs running VXLAN, oh, sorry, OVS with uh, VLAN just for to make sure A doesn't break B or vice versa. Yeah, and that's something that the Neutron team will have to decide okay. for their own gating jobs on what they want to do because the configuration is per project and okay. Okay. that's okay. something there Neutron. An example of like in Cinder like that is we have Ceph running, it's ga Ceph is gating on Nova, Cinder, and Glance jobs because there's a Ceph backend in all of them. Um, but Cinder also has um, jobs for Sheepdog and GlusterFS just on Cinder changes, I think. But it, it's not on, like, Nova changes. So the, pr that's, the projects do have some control over what they're testing in their own projects. In the case, the uh, unit tests and uh, integration tests run in parallel. Has there been much discussion about running the unit tests first? If any of the unit tests fail, stop immediately and not to run the integration tests? Oh, the uh, staged gating? Yeah. Um, that has something. That is something that has been discussed before. Um, I, I, there are reasons why we haven't done it. Um, I don't actually recall them off the top of my head. I think it has something to do with our utilization rates and not actually helping throughput as much as people think. I don't actually know the answer off the top of my head. But there, there have been mailing list discussions about that. And I'm sure it'll come up again. Yeah. A typical situation I'd see is if you submit a change and straight away the unit tests fail, you do have to wait before you submit another change until all Well, I mean, you, 
you can see all of the um, results in progress on the status.openstack.org page. Um, it shows every job that's running on every change, and you can see a unit test fail when it happens while the integration tests are still running, um, as at least a quick workaround. Uh, but yeah. And people should run Pepe and Top yeah. On that same note, uh, the website only asks you to run a few tests, the PIP8 and the TOX27 and all that, but the gate has a lot more. I mean, there's not much documentation around those. I always see all them right. failing. Um, yeah, so I thought there was decent documentation on setting up a dev stack environment and running Tempest on it. Um, we might need to put that in a more... Um, more global situation, more global location, like in the Infra Manual for developers or something, because it is something that's doable as long as you have a dedicated machine um, for running the tests. Because DevStack does kill a node. We do that already, but this like grenade the DSVM test, those keep failing, and I don't. Okay. I mean, I couldn't find anything. How to this, oh, grenade that documentation, that is a weaker point, um, because Grenade is a very special subset for doing upgrade testing, um, and that's probably a good to do, um, because I do agree the docs on setting up a Grenade environment are a little weak. There have been some recent changes to make it easier, so that's something we'll, we'll, we'll work on in the community to improve. Okay. Well, we're out of time, yeah. so yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.